Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to the world's greatest podcast. <laughs> this is the podcast that reviews superhero comics by DC, superheroes by DC throughout the ages. This is Slam. I'm your co-host, Mike Allen, as always, I'm joined by Joshua Morvell, and today we're going to be taking a look at some of the origins of Green Arrow. Yes! And we're joined by Adam Peltier, Adam Antium. Thanks for joining us, Adam. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for that great nickname. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about one of my favorite superheroes. Um, it'll be interesting, too, because this is all a little bit before my introduction to Green Arrow, so this is quite a treat to be treated to this and also to learn how different of a character he was to start out with but uh we'll get into that in a bit yes that's the thing is i mean I, i've known green arrow my whole life and i was a huge fan of the cw tv show for at least the first couple years i think it was really well written um but i still had never read this especially this golden age origin i had never read this and i was quite shocked by some of what i saw um but um to be honest, one of the things um, I've learned on this podcast is I didn't realize how drastically different some of these Golden Age origins were. Um, and, and what I have to point out uh, uh, about Green Arrow, Aquaman, Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, those five are the only ones that were not rebooted in the 1950s. They continued, the only hmm. five that continued straight all the way through. So that's why to me it's more shocking when you have a character who, um, you know, you're reading his adventures every month and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, by the way, we're gonna we're gonna show you his origin again. And it's completely different than the last time you read it, you know, so. But then again, no one would really be reading these comics more than say five years. So the kids reading these in the 50s would not have remembered the ones from the 40s anyway, so. Mm. So anyway, yeah, so we are, so we can see a picture here of um, Green Arrow, the golden age Green Arrow. Right. The first thing to point out is he doesn't have blonde hair. He doesn't have a goatee. Uh, in his earlier appearances, he did have blonde hair, but then it kind of went back and forth. And so what they did in later years was they made him have brown hair just to differentiate him from the blonde haired uh, silver and bronze age uh, Green Arrow. Also, I always assumed that, again, because you always think of the Earth One continuity starting in the 50s, I would have thought that's when he got his new costume, but he didn't get his new costume until Neil, Neil Adams redesigned it, which we'll get to later on. Mm -hmm. But for now, we're going to talk about his first appearance, which was in More Fun Comics 89. If we ever start a new podcast, I'm going to call it the More Fun Podcast, okay? Because that's a <laughs> cool name. But um, I believe, who's going to do this one? Is it Adam? Uh, I no, am. No, Josh. Josh, yeah. all right. Yeah, uh, yeah, so we start off this one. Uh, Green Arrow and Speedy are stopping a couple of uh, bandits. Uh, they uh, catch them. Cops come and arrest them. And they go back off to their uh, secret headquarters. And as they're there, they're kind of talking about how this mission kind of reminded them of their origin and how they met each other. And uh, we flash back to Speedy's origin uh, at first, and we see him and his father and uh, some politically incorrect, uh, for today's standards, uh, uh, use of indigenous people. And uh. Uh, we have a character named Kohog, who is essentially their servant, like their... Mm slave uh ward and uh anyways this this plane crashes on this island and uh the only survivors are speedy and quahog and while there they have to kind of survive because it's this deserted island nobody can get to and uh we see this helicopter uh, in the distance years later as speedy has like developed these amazing uh uh arrow uh, skills and uh, we cut to uh, Green Lantern or Green Lantern geez, <laughs> Green Arrow uh, uh, at the, around the same time and uh, he's working well, you, in this you museum. Mean Oliver Queen. Oliver Queen correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oliver Queen he's working in this museum and these bandits come in and they're trying to steal a bunch of stuff and uh, while he is stopping them a fire starts and the museum burns to the ground and everything inside of it so uh he's kind of depressed so his boss is like why don't you 
fly over to this deserted island. There's a lot of like. Uh, I wish my boss would do that. Sorry. I wish my boss would yeah. do that every time I was down and out at work. Have you accidentally started a fire in yeah. your office? No, but I've been down and out at work, and it'd be nice to be like, you know what? If you're having a bad day, just go to this desert, deserted island I know about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And go learn how to hunt, um, <laughs> anyway, with a bow and arrow. So, uh, uh, and and we cut back to Speedy, and we actually see that it's not uh, Oliver Queen's uh, plane that shows up. It's these bad guys mm-hmm. who are there to hunt for, like, this gold mine. And uh, Kohog and Speedy uh, get away from these guys. And as they're walking through the forest, they actually bump into Oliver Queen. They have a little tussle and they realize that they're not actually enemies, but then the bad guys show up. So uh, they tie them up, uh, like kind of like knocking them, knocking them around in the tent. And Kohog shows up and uh, saves them, he frees them. And as they're running away, Kohog's actually shot. So they take refuge in this cave, and as they're crawling through, they actually accidentally discover this ancient council room, this, like, gigantic cavern full of these golden statues and gold bars and all these treasures. So uh, here they kind of have their final stand. Together, they work They work together to, like, shoot arrows at him and, and avenge Kohog, uh, and uh, uh, they end up knocking down this gigantic golden statue on top of them all defeating them and uh we catch up to them current day again and uh they walk into a room and in a glass case they have Kohog's bow uh, and arrows kind of like as a as a, a memorial to him right in his so, honor, so i just want to quickly give credit to the creators here this was written by someone i've never heard of oh. joseph samoxon okay Never heard of him. And the artist was Cliff Young, and the inker, inks were by Steve Brody. Um, I'm just going to say that, again, I'm a big Green Arrow fan, but this alternate original version of his origin is something I've never read. And there's a lot of things about it. Like, okay, first of all, the structure of the story told out of order, which was almost complicated to a fault. It was actually yeah. slightly hard to keep track of where it was jumping around. I was also surprised by Speedy's characterization as, I'm going to assume he was influenced by kind of like 1930s, almost like Bowery Boys, uh, like this smart ass street kid, right? That ends Mm. up becoming his ward and like arguing with them and calling Oliver Queen names. Um, Also, again, because of the TV show, I always think of Oliver Queen on the island, Oliver Queen. This origin focuses on Speedy for the majority Mm -hmm. of it. So that's something different, um, but over. But, but right, he he learns. Uh, Oliver Queen learns how to use a bow and arrow, uh, just because he works in a museum and he likes old stuff. Right. <laughs> like it's not really. <laughs> so this is completely <laughs> you know. different. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, again, by the standards of the books we're reading, it's actually pretty good. Um, uh, Adam, what did you think of this one? There is a lot to tackle with this. Um, okay. Like you said, structurally, it's a bit bizarre. You have them just recounting their origin, which isn't exactly unprecedented in comics, but then the way it's told, not only because predominantly, as you say, Speedy's origin is more the focal point. Mm. He's developing his skills. He's like developing muscle because he's roughing it on this island with Koog. And then you have Oliver Queen, who's just, I'm that good of a man. I just know how to shoot arrows, like Mm. precisely. Like there's no like, burning or development of his skill but also the way the story unfolds as they're talking to one another like there's a sequence where they're like taking showers and like they're trading yeah. off taking showers yes i noticed that Strange. <laughs> it's just like a bit bizarre mm. and then something else i want to mention is the art because the sure. art at points yeah. i think some of the graphic elements do work at times. And I do love, maybe it's just this reissue of it, how the colors really pop. But then there's other inconsistencies. Like there's a scene with uh, Kohog. I think he's standing with Speedy right after they leave the uh, crashed plane. And his hand seems like three sizes too large for his body as he's looking over it. Um, Yeah. And then there's the scene where Oliver Queen is captured by the thugs on the island. 
and he's laughing at this uh, misunderstanding they had because they overheard the conversation he had where. Oh, I think you just had it, Josh. Here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's middle there. They were they were being told <laughs> uh, something around the uh, realm of oh, there's a treasure trove or there's a gold mine of archaeological. Uh, objects here and then someone overheard his gold mine so they thought it's a literal gold mine so all over queen's laughing but in this image he turns into the crypt creeper like it's he has pretty so, bad yeah he has mm -hmm. so many lines on his face like he's 80 right. in this panel i don't right. understand what happened not only that but i feel like the storytelling and the the like the, the action a lot of the time is getting lost and i'm having to read what's happening rather than seeing yeah. it. Yeah. Like, it's so confusing, like, especially here in this fight. Like, these guys show up in the museum, they start fighting each other, and then uh, Oliver Queen pins them down, and then we just cut to the building exploded. Like, fire. He there's just, like, fire behind Oliver Queen with the guys tied up. We don't see that, like, happen or how the escape is they're just like yeah a bunch of guys showed up and i fought right. them i'm not gonna show you but right. i fought them and defeated them don't worry like it's just kind of jarring at times how they just jump right to uh like cut away from action or have to like mm -hmm. say what's happening rather than you know us seeing it yeah, i think well, that's a good way of putting it uh, you know another thing that i noticed too like beyond that there are sequences where there's great body motion. Even the page that, uh, Josh, you were just on mm. features uh, Koog kind of like doing a Raiden Superman style like attack on somebody. Right. Yeah. yeah, here. There's some great body motion in other sequences in the page, but this just is ridiculous. And um, I didn't want to touch too much on Koog because I feel like we all know the problem with this character. Right. But, you know, racist stereotype, like, mm. yeah. Granted, we all know the era this came from. We mm. all know the type of tropes that were happening in adventure comics and mm -hmm. stories, but it was rough reading this. And, yeah. And also, Oliver Queen being this archaeologist, it's like, oh, look at these great artifacts I've taken from all these indigenous people from <laughs> right. across the world. Oh, feel bad for me that it all burned down. It's like, I don't have sympathy for Well, you. the funny thing is, it's, it's like this is still happening like today. Like, you know, mm -hmm. like we just saw the Queen of England pass away. And uh, this just brings to the fore the fact that, you know, her entire fortune and the fortune of the whole British Empire was built on pillaging other, you know, cultures and stealing their resources, stealing their artifacts. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, this, this issue is still happening. Like, it's not a 1930s thing, you know, mm -hmm. it's still going on. But... But I, I do have to say, though, that I do like the idea that Oliver Queen, by the standards of the day, it's almost like Indiana Jones, like he's interested in these artifacts, right? Like, it's like there's different aspects of each origin that I think are really cool. And even though, um, what's his name? Que is it Queog? I mean, I think, Quahog, he's, I, think yeah. he's, Quahog, I think he's a play on Mo uh, the Moby Dick character, Queequeg, but... Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Like, I, obviously, the, the, the actual characterization is terrible, but I like the idea of having that Native American element in his origin, you know, which they do keep for Speedy, apparently. Um, mm. there's, there's a rebooted Speedy origin, which we actually didn't cover, but um, that is kept in his origin, which I think is kind of cool. Um, but, yeah, like, the characterization right. is horrible, obviously. We also kind of see similarly this origin in the next one we're going to be talking about, but right. it's kind of passed from Speedy to Oliver Queen. So, right, mm -hmm. right, right. Yeah. So, and, and as far as the art, I think the art is, it's funny because I was thinking of how clear it is, but now that you've given all those examples of bad storytelling, I guess it's not, it's definitely not great, but it's appropriate for the time. And I don't think it's terrible. It's just not uh, stellar, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's that, I think, with this origin. What do you, anything else to say about <sighs> this issue? No, I no, mean. No, I guess not. Okay. No, like it, it's, it's. <laughs> It's a fine issue for what it is, but um, I think an update on it was needed and sure. definitely welcomed. I mean, even the little, like, second one we're going to be talking about, this, like, small little, like, six-page story or whatever it was, yeah. was a little bit of a better origin, like, a way oh, to, yeah. to, to figure mm -hmm. out, you know. Um, 
I would like to touch upon the thing. naming of the heroes, though, just very briefly, because, you know, I didn't think it was that bad when the, you know, villains referred to our young ward as Speedy because he's so quick. I thought, oh, okay, that's kind of neat. But then they said to Oliver Queen, oh, he shoots a mean green arrow. And I was like, mm -hmm. what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> I know. The arrow doesn't even look green in the photo. So I, I didn't even really get that reference. Um, right. That, that seemed a bit arbitrary to me. Oh, yeah. That's just a forced way to try and explain why they have those names right. Like, it gets even funnier in the – there's a Mike Grell reboot from 88 or something or 89. And they actually make a joke out of it where – the bad guys that he captures, like when the cops are asking him what happened, they're like, oh, we, we got beaten by that arrow guy. And Green Arrow's like, arrow guy? <laughs> so then he, he decides to call himself Green Arrow. I was just kind of like, well, I'm not going to call myself arrow guy. You know? But, <laughs> yeah, it was kind of funny. Um, but anyway, w was there something else you were going to say, Adam? No, that was it. I just I just wanted to comment on that. I mean, that's that's the origin. That's the official thing. Yeah, so like I said, so this version has kind of been lost to history because I didn't even barely know about it. But then we get the rebooted origin of Green Arrow in Adventure Comics number 256, which at the time starred Superboy and it co-starred Green Arrow and Aquaman. And, the, and then what had happened is I believe a few issues before this, maybe six months before, Jack Kirby had become the artist on uh, Green Arrow. Now, this is obviously before Marvel, um, and I don't know exactly what his reputation was at the time. I'm sure he was a respected artist, but you got to figure he's already about 42 years old. Hmm. Um, so he's already wow. a veteran. Yeah, he's already established. He's already respected, but he's not the superstar Jack Kirby that he'll become within a few years at Marvel, right? So this is him kind wow. of in between, you know, big assignments doing Green Arrow. And I've actually read all these in this collection. And uh, yeah, they're pretty good. They're pretty fun. But this is the issue where they go back to his origin. And so once again, we start off in the present day, uh, Green Arrow talking to Speedy. Um, and again, this is a slightly more modern uh style of comic book it's, it's 1959 so what ends up happening is they set up the flashback in a different way what happens is they find out that someone is going to be going to starfish island okay mm -hmm. so this is a newly named island and uh green arrow's like well get on your costume we got to go there and <laughs> we got to stop these guys so we see them again now we should point out the green arrow's always kind of been a poor man's batman right like when he was created he he had his arrow car, he had his arrow plane, he had his arrow cave, like mm -hmm. everything, like just second rate Batman, unfortunately. So we see Green Arrow and Speedy flying to Starfish Island, and then this is where he flashes back to one night I accidentally fell off a sh the ship. Uh, he was he was riding in a ship um, because he was a playboy. <laughs> this is where I think it's established that he was a rich playboy, which is... Oh. Yeah. So he wasn't a playboy before, isn't that funny? He was just like the uh, the guy that worked at the museum. So he falls off the boat, which again is the origin they use in the TV show. He swims to the island and he's completely by himself. So he's got to learn to fend for himself. Like in, um, what's that Tom Hanks movie? Castaway. Uh, Castaway. Castaway. Yeah. So we see him. He's like, um, you know, he, he's like fashioning his own bow and arrow here. Um, and then he's, you know, learning these tricks. And then they even go as far to show the detail of like, okay, well, I know how to catch this fish, but... Even though my arrow's in the fish, the fish is still swimming away. So that's what gives him the idea to design the rope arrow. So now this is the beginning of his trick arrows, okay? Mm -hmm. Now I have to point out something. When Mike Grell uh, took over Green Arrow in the mid to late 80s, he got rid of the trick arrows. He got rid of Star City. Like, oh, no, he's got to be in Seattle. And at some point you go, he's, he's a superhero. Right. If you take away all those things that are cool, then he's no longer a superhero, right? So I, anyway, I like the trick arrows. I like Star City. Mm -hmm. I like all, all that campy stuff. I love it. But For sure, see, the trick arrows. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. Green Arrow, right? So we see him like, oh, look at this great Kirby shot of him pulling the fish out of the uh, the ocean there. Um, and like, you know, and like mm -hmm. this is the detail of the giant. Okay, which, uh, on page four, 
look at the, on panel four that that giant close up of the hand. You would never see that. Yeah. Another artist would never draw that that type of close up, but Jack Kirby. And you it know? also like really describes how the how it works because it, right. it it obviously talks about how he uses the elastic to like drill and when I first read it I was like hmm, what but then looking at this visual it's so clear that the elastic is like used to like spin the arrowhead and then once right. released it like it's it's just so the the attention to detail is fantastic yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's it's great and that's the thing is, I mean, I love 60s Kirby, but there's a charm to this earlier work. Um, and even though, you know, you look at the close up of Oliver Queen's face at the top of page four, he never really cared about making his figures look too pretty. But the the dynamism of the the mm -hmm. figure of him holding that net is just incredible, I think. And then holding the mm -hmm. arrow in panel three, like, oh, I just love this. And then we see him taking a shot at a coconut and. And now this is where he invents his drill arrow, you know, and mm -hmm. and then on the next page, now we see that he's got like a primitive version of his green arrow costume, and um, yeah, it even explains why he's green. Yeah, well, right. Like he's he's, he's covering right? so, himself in leaves and stuff to camouflage yeah. to catch them. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Also, what ends up happening is yeah, so a ship, a commercial freighter is coming towards the island. So he's like, oh, look at that. Maybe there's signaling to see if anyone's ashore. So he decides to swim out and meet them. And sure enough, he comes in in the middle of a mutiny. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, he, he actually puts, like, not a mask, but... Um, he uses, like, grease. Yeah. Like oil or whatever. To, yeah, kind of like yeah grease himself. from the chain of the anchor to mm -hmm. create right. kind of like a domino mask for himself, which yeah, I thought was great. a really cool touch. Yeah. yeah. And so then he, yeah, then he pulls out the arrow and he and he's he's like, well, I'm gonna have to fight the bad guys. So then he takes a shot um, of an arrow and 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 uh, hits this um, oil canister or whatever. And then everyone starts slipping and sliding on it. Then he has his net arrow that he uses to capture the guys. Then we see that the whatever this is, the coast guard comes, and they're like, the green costume, the bow, and the tricky arrows, and that mask of grease. Just who are you? He's like, the Green Arrow. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Just call me Green Arrow. And then we cut back to the present day, and we see the Green Arrow and Speedy are flying in towards the island, and they see um, these guys that are about to enter the island, and they're going to find the mm. record that Green Arrow had been keeping of all of his adventures, right? right that he was carving. Um, in, on the cave wall. On the cave wall, right. Mm. And so uh, they decide to use what everyone has in their closet at home, a fake uranium arrow to create uh, fake radiation to trick their, um, whatever that's called, uh, the Geiger, the Geiger counter. The Geiger counter. And yeah. so the guys think that it's uh, radioactive. So they go, oh, we're not gonna go into the cave. So then they leave and that's pretty much the end of the story. That wraps it up and then we, that's it. That's the yeah. origin of the Silver Age Green Arrow. And I must say, vast improvement. That's what I think. Uh, Josh, what do you think? Yeah, uh, this origin's much better. Uh, it's also very clear as to what's happening. The art is fantastic. Uh, a little strange at times with the faces. Also, even like the masks. I don't. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know if this is a Kirby thing, or if this is what How his domino mask yeah. look like but it's very bad i don't understand why it's like triangle sunglasses it looks like like it doesn't even if you look it goes around they kind of look like they're members of devo right now <laughs> I, I don't know what the look is they're going for yeah, yeah it's not great but um i think this is a pretty strong origin uh, and a really great you know short little story agree um adam what do you think yeah, I think I'm just going to echo Josh's sentiments. Like, in spite of a few foibles here and there with some, like, artistic depictions, it's a great little story. It's a fantastic iteration of an origin for a character that I think a lot of people didn't consider what the origin would be for Green Arrow. Mm, I think most sure. people, I mean, outside of the CW series coming out, would have just assumed, oh, he's just a vigilante. Why do you really need to know the origin? I think this does a great job projecting who the green arrow character would be from here on end 
And there would be some um, variations of the characterization. Like, I think later on they retold the origin, and instead of just falling off the boat, there were pirates that took over the vessel, and right. he, like, jumped overboard so he could save himself, or some variations of that. But regardless, I think the core of what the Green Arrow origin is it's present here it shows his ingenuity it shows his intelligence and i think it just does a better job of depicting who the character is than what we saw before granted the type of characterization i'm used to seeing from oliver queen isn't quite here yet i think that's going to happen a little bit later particularly with the um, writer that we're going to be following this up with but uh i still am very satisfied with this this is such a great short story agree agree Oh yeah, do you want to bring up the pinup of Yeah. Green Arrow. Oh that one, yeah. All right, so now we're going to move to the Bronze Age Green Arrow. Now again, there was not really an updated origin until maybe 88, 89. But this is the I guess you'd say the revamp of Green Arrow. So Neil Adams had just started on Raven the Bold a few issues earlier and in this issue, he got a chance to draw Green Arrow, and I'm not sure what the circumstances were, but he completely redesigned his costume in this issue, and I have always loved this costume. Um, you know, the, the very unique design on his on his arms. I don't know if it's both arms or is it one arm with the, with the um, kind of straps around I think it's one on both, there. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is so freaking cool. Um, I just, it's a very simple design with the little G on his uh, oh, belt, but design. I've always thought this design was much cooler than the Golden Age design. Um, Adam, what do you think? Oh, by far. I mean, there's a reason this is the iconic green arrow. The beard, mm -hmm. the domino yeah. mask, the, you know, the armbands, like you said. Like, I, I remember, and I will confess, like, I've never seen an episode of the CW Green Arrow. Okay. Not out of any, like, you know, old man, like, yells at cloud syndrome, but just purely, like, I haven't got around to it. Right. Sure. Um, yeah. But it's one of those things where I first started, like, seeing some trailers for it. I, I went, where's the beard? Right. Because to me, the, it's, like, synonymous with Oliver Queen. And I think almost every iteration of him since neil adams took over basically had this sort of look in some form or other there's been variations but the domino mask like bearded look i think has been pretty consistent for him for a reason yeah i think Definitely. He, had, he kept the goatee all the way up to the 2000s or, or no even i think even he, today he still has a goatee well, right I, I think up until 2011 he, oh, okay. uh, when they when they did the new 52 they he might have lost it but I know that around that time they started um, trying to make him look like Stephen Amell from the TV show. Oh, which, gotcha. to be honest, like at this point, I'm okay with him losing the goatee, but I do think because what ended up happening was Mike Grell did redesign this costume in '86, '87, and I don't like his design as much. I think this costume, maybe with the hood instead of the hat, because I like the hood. Yeah, I do like the hood as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the goatee though. I, I don't know. It's so mm. iconic to this. I, yeah. I can't think of another hero that has a goatee quite like this. Like, sure. It's the full goatee, but the mustache is so long that he's got like a curly mustache. Even the mm -hmm. goatee kind of has like a little bit of a point to it uh, off of the chin. Yeah. It's so iconic. I think it also differentiates him from Robin Hood because sure. I feel like his original costume and even to this one to like a little bit of, of an extent is just robin hood right and even when i think of robin hood i think of him in green tights sure of course like, so um yeah this costume i really like i love the scarf like there's there's a lot oh, i yeah. really like about this one that just feels comic booky but also like real i can buy this costume also i love the different shades of green yeah. like the pants are light green the boots are dark green i love that i love that mm -hmm. monochromatic yeah. anyway okay so who's gonna summarize this this uh issue? oh yeah we, have, we also have an updated speedy but oh yes speedy who cares okay <laughs> yeah who cares next... no who cares? <laughs> for those who care yeah <laughs> um yeah I, you know this is also right 
if you guys remember, it was around this time, maybe a few years later, that Speedy was revealed to be a heroin addict, eh? Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I had think no just, idea. Yeah, yeah, it's just getting Wait, too... Oh, there was like an iconic... Are you, you're serious, right, Josh? Yeah, I, I, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. it was an iconic <laughs> um, comic cover. Uh, oh, Green wow. Arrow going, my ward's a junkie! It's yeah. oh man, it's incredible, and it fed into his character when he started going through rehabilitation. Um, Mike, Josh, you might remember uh, he left the Speedy moniker behind, and he adopted another pseudonym afterwards. You mean um, Arsenal? Arsenal, <laughs> and he's too comic booky. We can't have him be called Speedy, right? <laughs> But it did lead to some great characterization for a later Teen Titans, or actually at that point it was just the Titans run, which was like pretty exceptional. Mm. Um, also him becoming a father of Leanne, which was very criminal when something happened to said character, which I don't want to get into because it still upsets me to this day. Um, yeah, See, Speedy, is, uh, he started off as being a pretty annoying whelp, and I liked this version of him a lot more. The thing is, is, uh, and I just, I don't want to dwell on this, but it, it, it's one of those things that when I was a teenager, I was like, oh, this is serious stuff. we got to deal with real issues. But <laughs> now it's 50 <laughs> years later, and when you think about it, it just sounds ridiculous. It, like, imagine if Robin was revealed to be a heroin addict. Right. It, just, it just sounds ridiculous, you know? Um, so I'm actually trying to show Josh the cover. Um, okay. And for... Oh, and if you're listening to this podcast, we have to remind our listeners, this is also available as a video edition, so be sure That's to right. go to the Comic Book Syndicate website. I'm actually right? going to pull it up on my phone, the message, because if I touch anything on Skype, I'm going to mess up the... Okay. <laughs> so, oh, actually, it just popped up yeah, in the recording. So, oh, jeez. So geez. for you out there, you can see this <laughs> famous cover from uh, wow. Green Lantern, Green Arrow, number... What issue is it? Number eighty-five. So yeah, this is the this is the issue we we find out that Speedy is a junkie. But anyway, let's get back to this story because hmm. this is Brave and the Bold eighty-five, and this is the first time that uh, Green Arrow um, had this redesigned costume. And sorry, was it Josh? No, Adam. Adam. Yep. Adam's gonna tell us what happened in this one. Yes. Now time for something completely different. It opens up with Bruce Wayne holding the body of a senator who's been shot. Uh, now, the senator survives, but he is in very dire straits. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, being it's Bruce Wayne, we know what happens thereafter. He dons the Batman costume and runs around trying to see who the attacker may have been. Uh, he even goes to a, a, I guess you could say, a canvassing uh, van that's blaring out announcements that he suspects might have had the culprit, but uh, it does not have the person inside. Uh, the van escapes, and we are left to suspect that this is the actions of the one and only Mr. Minotaur, which you mm-hmm. know if you're born with a name like that, you have to be a super <laughs> got to do something mm-hmm. bad. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so there is a conflict happening, because Bruce Wayne goes to visit the senator later on while he's in a comatose state, and he's informed that there is this bill that's going to pass and the senator was going to vote on it. And if voted on, it could actually incarcerate said Mr. Minotaur and also uh, affect a lot of other criminals within the area. Now, they need another senator to vote on it, and Bruce Wayne is really hoping the senator's child, his uh, adult son, Ed, will end up usurping the role of senator and take over, but they say, no, Mr. Wayne, he doesn't want to. We have someone else in mind, you. And so Bruce Wayne is conflicted. He wants to be Batman and go out and investigate the crime and find out who shot the senator. But he's also beholden to this responsibility to potentially become a senator and vote on this legislation. I didn't realize we're getting to the West Wing, but this is kind of where the story's heading. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Yeah. Then uh, I really, really do love this. It's on, uh, I believe it's page four Four. of the comic. Mm -hmm. There is a great contrast which happens because we do have Bruce Wayne. He's brooding over this decision he has to make while he's on the phone. And the page is framed with a panel with Bruce in this dark blue light. Also with Oliver Queen at the bottom of the page framed in a very similar light in a very similar gesture. So I really like that pairing of the imagery. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Oliver Queen, of course, who at this point is a Playboy millionaire. He mm. is head of, uh, I believe it's Queen Industries. Uh, the exact name <laughs> of his company may not be that, but it's essentially that. Uh, mm. Basically, there is uh, another contractor that is potentially going to take over an island and some property that he, his company wants to bid on, and it's owned by none other than Mr. Minotaur himself. So there's obviously a conflict of interest happening here. Um, so he uh, recites some plans about what he's going to be doing to this land to an assistant as he dons the Green Arrow outfit, and then he notices a wayward window washer outside who <laughs> cracks open the glass and throws a grenade at him. It's an assassination attempt. Well, that ignites the office, destroys the plans. Luckily, luckily, Oliver Queen had a backup set of plans inside mm. his safe. So <laughs> right. we can rest assured on that. But this really is, I think, the inciting incident of where the two heroes are going to meet as per, mm -hmm. you know, the whole notion of what the Brave and the Bold series is about. Mm -hmm. So we have a motivation for Batman going after Mr. Minotaur, uh, also Oliver Queen with this assassination attempt and this sort of corporate uh, game of who is going to be able to take this property over. Uh, the next page features the senator's son, Ed, working out with Bruce Wayne. They're running some laps and Essentially, Wayne is doing his best to try to convince Ed that he needs to take over his father's role as a senator. Now, this is one of those very strange instances, which always throws me for a loop when I read older Batman comics, where Wayne yeah. admits to Ed that I can't do it because I am Batman and I have these responsibilities. So even though Ed is a little bit reluctant to believe him at first, he eventually is convinced um, there's this great visual gag that happens. It's on page uh, eight where Bruce Wayne just like effortlessly lifts up this dumbbell. And then there's these two uh, lunking meatheads behind him in the next panel that are just struggling to lift it up. Right. Which I, it's very <laughs> subtle, but it's, you know, it's very good. Uh, one thing I do want to mention that I thought was very bizarre was the fact that the reason Bruce Wayne trusted to divulge his identity as Batman to Ed was because he's actually a psychologist and because of his vow to not divulge information of his patients, he would never divulge his secret identity to anyone. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact he's not a patient. Despite the fact that right. he's not actually <laughs> fully legally obliged to do that, barring certain circumstances. It, it, it's funny. This is all mm -hmm. I'm getting at. Anyway, with this said, Ed is still not fully convinced, but he begrudgingly thinks maybe I ought to well, later on, he is then flown to an island by Oliver Queen. He's showing him the land that he wants to develop, explaining the conflict that would happen if Minotaur mm. took over this. And guess what he does? <laughs> he reveals that he is the Green Arrow. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and, and Ed's okay. just like, this is a weird day. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so I, on all this pressure... Ed reluctantly decides, ah, I should probably accept this. And there is a subsequent scene at night where he's in his office. He's debating over what he should do. Um, you know, he's mulling over this news he had about these two secret identities when a group of assailants come to him to kidnap him. Uh, in the eschewing scuffle, of course, Batman and Oliver Queen are not far behind. They look at the scene of the crime, do some detection. There's your usual banter that you would expect between the two, and they do happen to hear uh, a recording on a cassette of what the interaction was. So Ed was actually pretty clever. He was recording on the tape recorder to let them know where he's being taken and who mm -hmm. was responsible for it. Surprise, surprise, it's a guy called Mr. Minotaur. <laughs> So we go then to uh, the following page, which shows what happens the next morning where Bruce Wayne, because of Ed going missing, takes up the oath and will serve the state as a senator. Oliver Queen then is shown chasing after the boat that Ed has been kidnapped on uh, using a tracer arrow. Again, those trick arrows that we love so much to follow him. Uh, and then we actually get a first depiction of Mr. Minotaur in the comic. 
And I don't know if he was much of an established character before this. I was a little bit disappointed. I was hoping for some sort of man cow situation. <laughs> right. He's just like an old guy with a thinning hairline and sunglasses. So, you know. I'm actually going to look him up quick. Uh, this is his only appearance. So, obviously, a much beloved villain in the Batman canon. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's the usual threats being aimed at Ed, and then one of his thugs reveals that there is a mm. tracer put on the boat. Minotaur, in rage, crushes it with his hand, and poor Green Arrow is lost. He's lost within this cavernous confines of this cave that the boat happened to start navigating through, where Mr. Minotaur releases his pets, um, a bear, a mountain lion and a hog to attack the green arrow. <laughs> oh Amazing. man. I, I'm I'm not laughing because I'm making fun of this. Mm. I, I genuinely love this. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, of course he is the green arrow and he is, you know, an established hunter. So he shoots the uh, sailing beast pretty easily, except for the roaring mountain lion, I believe. Uh, mm-hmm. Or maybe it's the bear. I'm not quite clear with the artwork. Yeah, but, uh, I think maybe the bear. Mm-hmm. But uh, it re- turns out that he was actually being able to be uh, saved. The bear collapses on him. So he did have a perfect shot, but he would have been trapped underneath its carcass if not for Batman. Batman had followed Green Arrow through the cave to track him down, but now they're both lost. Green Arrow is uh, reasonably upset, wondering how they'll ever get out. And Batman, with being one of the world's greatest detectives and with great ingenuity throws a batarang at a bat Mm -hmm. knocks it out puts a tracer on it and releases the bat so that it will lead them out using echolocution so they can escape the caves Mm -hmm. it's great brilliant and also apparently um bruce wayne is uh guilty of animal cruelty at the same time (laughs) yeah it is smart though but yeah you're right totally ridiculous cruel you're right to animals it, it, it is, uh, regardless, though, ingenious. I do like that. Then, of course, we have a seaside uh, villain's lair overlooking this cliff where a minotaur is threatening Ed. They have a gun placed against his head, and they're getting ready for, you know, the final warning. You need to vote against this bill, not for it. Mm. And if you don't, we're going to eliminate you. We're going to eliminate other members of your family. Mm-hmm. Luckily, at that time, Green Arrow and Batman crash through the window, and they manage to not only save Ed, but beat up the thugs. Uh, on page, I believe it is 18, an amazing high kick from Batman that is sure to have pulled every tendon in his leg, <laughs> ripping his ACL <laughs> a couple different ways. Uh but joking oh, aside, it is a pretty decent action sequence. Mm-hmm. Menatar, however, manages to escape on his speedboat. Now, Ed is left behind with the two superheroes, but here is the conflict. They could go after Manatar, but there is time running out. That bill is going to send it very soon, and it needs to be voted on. Mm-hmm. So what's going to happen? Well, here's our solution that we have. There is a type of soiree that's going on where Mr. Manatar is there, and Oliver Queen in his his, um, civilian identity, not as Green uh, Arrow, goes and shakes his hand and starts talking with him. Uh, Now, of course, he starts letting out some not-so-subtle hints that he knows what's going on. He says, and I quote, too bad you didn't succeed in stealing my plans for Mm -hmm. it and killing me, Minotaur. Now, Minotaur is taken aback, His face is melting in the next page, apparently, (laughs) because he's just so distraught. Uh, And he's told, well, you're in an American embassy, so we're placing you under arrest. Uh, Oliver Queen does a great uppercut to him, and they fly away on the aerocopter? I'm not exactly sure what it is, if it has a name. Yeah. It kind of looks like the Batcopter from, like, Adam West. Batman, but not it's, but it's but not batman themed so I that's don't know true a... and i just want to say as an aside i like that it's not like themed or gimmicky it's just a helicopter sure. he's a millionaire he would have a helicopter it just right. makes sense I, I like that 
not everything has to be themed on brand for mm -hmm. you as a right. superhero. You know, take a hint, Batman. Well, at this time, Batman and Ed just make it to the Senate. Now, there is someone who's there who is going to plan to shoot Ed if he happens to appear. Luckily, Batman takes him out. And just in the nick of time, as the bill is about to be voted against, Batman tears off his cowl, puts on a suit, and Bruce Wayne comes in to vote yes on it, thus passing this bill securing the criminalization of Minotaur and other criminals throughout the cities. And the comic ends with both Bruce Wayne and Oliver Queen respectively giving their thanks to Ed and Ed thinking that he's going to now use self-hypnosis to erase the memories of these secret identities of Batman uh, and right. Green Arrow from his memory, the end. <laughs> so here, here's the thing, before we even get to what happens or compare it or anything, I want to give a, a thank you and a shout out to Bob Haney for writing a self-contained story, okay? Yeah. Because I just read a huge article about um, apparently in the late 60s, between 68 and 70, Marvel started going, moving away from continued stories and going to single issue stories, almost in imitation of DC. But you know what? Complain all you want. I like this. I like the fact that we can read this issue and get the whole story. Mm -hmm. I like how convoluted the plot is I, I like the last minute um you know not twist but the last minute little climax with bruce wayne i like the ticking clock the symmetry of both of them revealing their origins is pretty idiotic but i have to point out that yeah. this is written by bob haney bob haney is famous for two things writing harebrained stories and also <laughs> completely ignoring a uh, dc continuity like he would write stories that blatantly violated DC continuity. Like huh. he created a whole series of stories called, the, I think it was the Super Sons, where Bruce Wayne and Clark Kent both had sons, like fully grown teenage sons, and they did not fit into continuity. And so they had to actually invent another Earth form called Earth B for Bob. Um, <laughs> but the the B also huh. stood for other editors that wrote stories that didn't right. fit in with continuity. But he just did not care. So uh, in that respect, I thought the story was really fun. Yeah, that's kind of fun, too. I feel like not thinking about continuity can be good. Right. And, you know, you're able to have that creative freedom. But uh, in moments like this, it really is super annoying. Like, I know it's a comic book. and You're supposed to suspend some level of disbelief. But both of them revealing their secret identity to this guy for seemingly no reason is so annoying because yeah, it's not even like he helps them in any way him mm -hmm. knowing their secret identity doesn't come into effect bruce wayne still agrees to uh to to be the uh to st step in for the senator and why did green arrow i can't even remember why why um Oliver Quinn revealed his identity, but I don't think it ended up mattering in the mm. end, of, you know, at, at the end of the story. And, and this guy does not help them out in any way. Like mm -hmm. it's just, I don't know, maybe just for this one payoff of him recording, but I feel like you could sell it as if he's being attacked and he's knows he's going to be kidnapped. He's doing that to save his own, butt, no matter what, if Batman, <laughs> and Green Arrow are involved or not, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. It's just, I really, I, I, it just left a sour taste in my mouth. But other than that, I really did enjoy this issue. Um, mm -hmm. This this character is also likable. Uh, uh, again, this like one-off uh, son of a senator character. Mm -hmm. Um, Manitar is also interesting, especially now knowing that he's like only appears in this, like he's named Manitar and he mm -hmm. has a, essentially a zoo that he could just release while on a speedboat in a cave. Mm -hmm. It's great. And uh, no one ever used him again. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I liked it as a whole. The art as well, I really enjoyed in this one. Um, everything feels very solid. The The inking is a little bit sketchy at times, but 
mm. I think is fine for for the most part. Um, and I also really do like when uh, the characters are allowed to kind of be a little bit like pushed and exaggerated, particularly <laughs> like Minotaur when he realizes like what's happening. I love this because this is like goofy, but also like a believable, like squished, yeah. like shocked face. Uh, right. It's great. So and, and and even like the inking being like or the colors being solid color to really kind of be this dramatic mm -hmm. like almost a stage play reveal like the red spotlight is on him it's great right. so, it's a great touch yeah, yeah it's brilliant yeah. so yeah I, I had a lot of fun with this issue yeah adam what'd you think uh you know i had mixed feelings about this one because mm -hmm. certainly like there were some goofier elements that we talked about some plot points that really didn't need to be there but I do right. like the fact, as you pointed out, it's a one and done. It tells mm. a pretty comprehensive story about an assassination attempt. Batman not going above and beyond, you know, having to fight an intergalactic alien or a superpowered beam, but just trying to figure out what's happening with this assassination attempt. Mm -hmm. I, I like when we have grounded Batman stories. And right. all of her queen stories are almost always grounded except when he was with Green Arrow, which I, I like because he is always self-admittedly out of his comfort zone when he's paired with Green Arrow in the, well, especially with the Neil Adams series too. That was in particularly where I was introduced to him. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's not so much what this comic might do wrong or what it did, but what it didn't do. Because he, spoilers mm -hmm. for those who don't know where Green Arrow's character would go his company would end up being bought out by another millionaire and he would basically uh, be left destitute. Uh, he would travel around America and he grew this social consciousness where he started tackling more topical issues. And a lot of that mm. was covered within the crossover series that uh, he had with Green Lantern. Right. Uh, and that was my introduction to it. Those were actually a smattering of comics I bought used as a child. And it was that kind of introduction to these, I guess you could say, B-tier heroes where, as a child, you may not know who Green Lantern or Green Arrow are necessarily. You've heard their names, but maybe you don't have the best idea of it. But then I was shown tackling these um, really heavy subjects. Like, mm -hmm. So refreshingly, what comics could do and what superhero comics could do. This, in a way, talking about political corruption, yeah. I think airs closer to that. And it's not quite the Oliver Queen that I best love the Oliver Queen where he is an advocate for social justice where he butts heads with uh, Batman and even mm -hmm. the Lantern in terms of how he wants to approach fighting crime but you know I think this is a really good launch pad to show where his character is going to go and the type of tone his stories are going to have um, overall I think it's pretty good I aside from being the debut of this depiction of him physically I, I wouldn't say it really is essential but i think as a you know an origin for the new look you know it could be worse yeah, yeah um and, and obviously we have mostly neil adams to thank for that i mean bob haney did write the story but clearly neil adams was steering the ship as far as uh green arrows look um and maybe he even suggested the sort of change in direction for his character i don't know that for sure but um, this issue was weird. It, it's, it's an interesting one because Bob Haney, um, I associate him more with the Silver Age, but he, he did write a lot in the Bronze Age. But he is, I guess you could say, a relic of the Silver Age in that he didn't, I mean, he was successful in the 70s, but he didn't really fit in with the style that was becoming more and more popular um, uh, with Marvel and then later with DC. But... Um, but that all being said, it was an interesting, entertaining issue. And right now, I am reading a lot of uh, Marvel. I'm reading um, Lee and Kirby FF and Lee Romita Spider-Man. Mm. And like I said, it's refreshing to read a done in one story, even though the twist, some of the twists are a little forced and convoluted. Yeah. Um, I did enjoy it. I also want to talk about the art because I am a fan of Neil Adams, and he's a great guy. I don't want to say anything bad about him, but... Knowing his reputation and knowing how good he is, I found the art a little bit sloppy in this issue. And I know this is very early on, so I don't want to be too critical. But, like, whereas the covers were always 10 out of 10, as you flip through the issue, 
some of the figures get a little bit sloppy. Um, like, you know, most of the panels are really well done, but um, then you'll have like an awkward, like uh, Adam, you pointed out when I think it was Batman does that one kick. Or was oh, it here, yeah. Out? Yeah, what page is that on? Yeah, like it's just just these weird lapses. Like, I, and, and again, I want to be too critical because you're talking about an artist that redefines superhero art. So he, we know he's a master. It's just that I'm surprised that some of the panels are not as good as others, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a little bit, little bit sloppy, but still very, like we, we know his anatomy is great. Um, he's very realistic, but also very creative with his panel layouts and his storytelling, you know? And so um, mm -hmm. it's like, I am criticizing him, but I'm still acknowledging at the, at this time, it was state of the art superhero work. So, you know, I brought up earlier that one uh, panel where we had Bruce Wayne at the top and we had Oliver Queen at the bottom creating a nice parallel between the two. And I think in terms of layout, that's something that you brought up. It's a great example of that because you also have the jagged panel on the left hand side. It's mm -hmm. not just a perfect square. The next page as well, where it's showing Oliver Queen within his uh, apartment suite, we do have like thinner panels. We have ones at an angle showing less conventional use of uh, attributing panels to the page. And I think it works really well. It creates a great sense of dynamics. I do agree, like this is early on in his career. So you can see a few flubs here and there. Yeah. And even though we did laugh at that Batman high character, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. This is the type of thing where there's a few comics I read where I would almost argue it would be better if they just removed all dialogue and they just let you read it visually. And I think, mm. In a, its own way, this would be much more satisfying reading it in that capacity. That's a fair point. Like, um, yeah, if there, like, if silent comics were a thing back then, you're right. Like, even if you go to the page on now, Josh, like, that building, that perspective is something mm -hmm. no one else would have done at that time. Um, the next page is one of the weakest. If you go to page seven, that's one of the yeah. weakest pages in the whole book. Like. It almost looks like it was added in later. Like, those figures at the top are terrible. The face is terrible. I mean, I know that Neil Adams did work with assistants. It's possible they helped on this page, but this page does not look up to snuff by his standards. Well, hmm. do you know the Neil Adams' uh, hatred for uh, promotional ads in the comic? No, no. Uh... So I, I heard this, so I don't want to say that this is a fact. So... You know, people can chime in in comments, uh, you know, if they've heard this validated. But I heard he hated when the panel was going to be usurped by some sort of ad like what mm. we're seeing here. And sometimes he would just do rush to work just because he thought wow. it wasn't worth his time. Uh. Interesting. Well, that makes perfect sense then. Yeah. Wow. Well, let's move to the next one here. Yeah, because, I mean, even look at this. Right, like it is a little bit. Yeah, it's not great. That's not great. Yeah, but like it, we were even confused what animal this was because the face kind of looks like mm -hmm. cat, but then like the the build and the paw looks like a bear. Yeah, but now jump back to page nine, and look at the creativity of the the layout of this page, like mm -hmm. the, the the opening panel, then looking behind the helicopter, then the close up in the circle, then the two shot, then mm -hmm. the extreme long shot with a nice sunset background and the silhouetted figures. Like, that's great. That's great. And then the next page is great too. You know, like the, the dark blue lighting, um, you know, alone mm -hmm. at night in the office. That That's a great page. Yeah. It's really good. You know, it also kind of feels like there's a lot of dynamic panels except for these pages. Again, like it's just kind of the ones on the, on the and ad then, pages, yeah. Yeah, and then and then we're kind of back to these very dynamic uh, panel layouts. Interesting, yeah. Yeah. I mean, now I know something I didn't know until I was older, that a lot of comic artists also rely on aftermarket, like selling their original pages. Mm. And so maybe he also felt like, well, these pages with the ads on them, I can only get half as much money, so why would I... Right. Oh, my best work. That's possible uh, too, right there. Yeah. yeah. Well, interesting. I never thought of it that way. Yeah. So yeah, it would be interesting if anyone can validate that. Again, I just heard that uh, said to me at some point, but uh, if anyone could verify that, that'd be wonderful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, overall, again, that's not a rebooted origin, but definitely a revamped 
version of Green Arrow, and that's the one that I think we're all more familiar with. Um, he kept this costume for about 15 or so years until it was revamped again by Mike Grell. But mm-hmm. this version of, of Green Arrow with the sort of hot-headed temper and the uh, left-leaning politics is the one that still persists to this day. As far as I know, because I haven't read him in a while, but he definitely lasted a while. Um, again, if you if you get a chance to check out the TV show, especially the first few seasons, it's very well done. And okay. they spin the origin in, a, in, a, in another direction that is awesome. That's all I'm going to say. Hmm. But uh, they they exploit the the idea of that island so well. I just anyway, I love the TV show. Hmm. So yeah, that's salivating for it. Good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely check it out. And you haven't seen it either, Josh? No, no, I've oh. I've seen episodes, but I haven't seen like a full season. It's the yeah. first couple seasons are very good. Definitely check them out. Mm. Okay. Um, and then I think did I give you the last Neil Adams pinup? Um, did I send it to you? I don't believe so. Uh, no. That's too bad. But guess what? I have it right here. So I can just drop it into the chat. And I can... I, I don't know if this is going to show up on your end, but... Yeah, it kind of shows up in the little corner here. Okay, but it's a nice little pinup on yeah. you, Adam. So, yeah, like, um, again, I love this Green Arrow look. I love this design. Mm-hmm. And you know, one thing I haven't mentioned yet, I love this classic Green Arrow logo that's on the cover of Brave oh, and the Bold. Oh, yeah. Oh, like yeah, that's good. Something like the, the the three dimensions of the arrow word, but also the the actual arrow mm-hmm. that, ha- that has a shadow. It casts a shadow on the logo. Are you kidding me? That's freaking awesome. Yeah, that's fun. Wow. Um, and I'm just looking through. See the who's who page for the. Um, if you go back one more, um, Josh, that Green Arrow logo, not as cool. It, it's very, it has its own retro right. feel, to it, but it's just not as cool, you know. Like yeah. It. No, I agree. Anyway, so yeah, there you go, Green Arrow in the Golden Age, Silver Age, and Bronze Age. I forgot what order they went in. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then you know, there's more changes to come. But this is pretty much these are the iconic versions here, and uh, yeah, I'm definitely interested in reading more. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, we want to thank Adam Antium for joining us on this episode, Adam. It was a pleasure as always. Thank you. Uh, I believe your invitation to guest host has been extended to the next episode Ooh. because we're also going to be reviewing another A-list superhero in the form of Aquaman. So if nice. you're available in two weeks, yeah, please join us for the Aquaman episode. That would be swimming, if I could. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Josh, you take it from there. All right, thank you guys so much for listening to the episode or watching it on YouTube. Uh, you can find all of our stuff over on our website at thecomicbooksyndicate.com. All of our podcasts are video format now, so you can actually see what we're talking about. The comics, the movies, the TV shows. Uh, let us know what you guys think about it. Leave us a comment and uh, stay in touch. That's right. So until the next time, see you later. Thank <laughs> you.